I love this theme. I love the fact that it is whatever. And it's not the kind of whatever it's like, hey, whatever. It is with a purposeful whatever. Paul wants us to really think about the things that we think on and what we say, where our heart is, where we're going, where we're living, who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that this morning will be a, just a, a morning of encouragement, of exhortation, of love, just as this letter when Paul first pen, penned it, um, was intended to be. So let's bow our hearts together as we seek the Lord for his blessings this morning. Heavenly Father, we just ask this morning that you will shower us with your blessings if, as we spend this time together in your word. I pray, Father, that you would encourage us, that you would speak your truth into our heart, Lord, and that we will leave here um, just more knowing who we are in you. Father, and what we can do to stand firm and to stand fast until you come back for your church. We love you, Father. We praise you. Be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this letter is from Paul, and it's to believers who were in Philippi. It is known as the Epistle of Joy. It's a letter that is filled with encouragement, exhortation, um, and love from the Apostle Paul to the believers in Philippians, in Philippi. It's a thank you note to the believers for their help in Paul's hour of need. He also provides instructions on Christian unity and how to continue to live and to walk in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to also remember that Paul is writing this epistle as he is under house arrest in Rome. He had not seen the Philippians for years, and he loved them and missed them dearly, and somehow they heard that Paul was in need. So they sent their friend to go and minister to Paul, but their friend was sick, so Paul sent, them back, sent him back early, but with this epistle filled with encouragement and love for the Philippian church. In this final chapter of Philippians, chapter 4, the Apostle Paul closes with an appeal for all believers to stand fast, to stand firm in the Lord, to be steadfast, to continue strong in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be united in heart and in purpose. And I think that this exhortation is just as important for us today as it was for in Paul's time, or the, when he read it the first time. So will you turn to chapter 4, and we're going to read the first seven verses of Philippians. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Eurodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So because of the truth that Paul had been writing about, up to the, the third uh, chapters, he now goes on to say, because what Jesus has done for us, because of who he is, because of his life and his death and his resurrection, because he has given us victory over sin and death, therefore, since we have this glorious hope, this great truth in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the Lord. He had already told them earlier in chapter 1, verse 27. He says this, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So basically, he has been encouraging, you guys stay united, be united, don't let anything rip you apart from the faith that Jesus Christ has given to you. In closing this letter, he wants to remind them again about the importance of staying strong in the Lord, and we need to be reminded of that as well today. They are in the midst of the enemies of the cross, as Philippians 3.18 states. They would be influenced in the ways that would undermine their Christian stability. 
There was a real danger that they would be drawn away and enticed, so they had to make a personal resolution in their hearts to be steadfast, to stand firm. They needed to stand firm in the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To be steadfast is to be fixed in a direction, to be firm in purpose, unwavering, firmly established. And Paul is basically saying, never ever give up your Christian walk, because that is your life. Don't cave in to the pressures that are going to be upon you and that are already upon you. And again, I believe that word is for us this morning too. <clears throat> the reality today, the church seems to have fallen asleep. We have become lethargic. And it seems that many are leaving their Christian faith for other things that seemingly satisfy for just a moment. Too many Christians are not seeking the truth. They're tired of church, tired of church people. That means you and me. They are tired of serving. They're tired of walking with the Lord. They're tired of obeying the Lord. They are filled with excuses for reasons why they have left Jesus behind. And Paul desperately doesn't want this to happen to the Philippian church. And I know our pastors, your pastor, my pastor, my husband, he does not want us wavering in our faith and getting sucked up in the ways of this world. There seems to be a willingness to leave the truth whenever truth isn't convenient for us. If we aren't centering our lives on the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God, we are going to find ourselves on a very slippery slope of destruction. We will find ourselves buying into the world's philosophies, adopting their priorities, and living a life filled with compromise and not living a life filled with loving Jesus Christ. John MacArthur says, if Christians are to live in keeping with who they are as children of God, they must live according to the word of God through the power of his Holy Spirit. In other words, believers are always to keep their feet firmly planted in the revealed truth of the Gospels. Paul loved the Philippians. He loved them so desperately. That's why he says in verse 1, Brothers and sisters, you who I love and I long for, you're my joy and my crown. Please, I'm begging you, stand firm. Stand firm, and this is how you're going to stand firm, dear friends. I'm going to show you with the rest of this chapter how we can stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pay attention to the words that I'm telling you. This comes deep from Paul's heart because he loves these people so much. He doesn't want them wavering. He says, stand firm in unity. Not only do we stand firm in the Lord, who, has, who is our solid foundation, but we need to stand firm in the unity as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he implored Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. In the New Living Translation, he says, please, you belong to the Lord. Will you please settle your disagreements? These two women were Paul's friends, and he is begging them as Christians to be reconciled. These two ladies were active members in the church. They worked with Paul. They served alongside Paul in the cause of the gospel. These faithful servants who were faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ and serving Paul, being there, whatever his need may have been, now have seemed to suffer some kind of disagreement. We don't know what happened. And uh, maybe that's a good thing. You know how nosy we can be. We want to know all the dirt on things. So this is just left open for our imagination. But Paul doesn't really um, give them strong um, discipline in this letter. He's basically saying something happened. You guys are in disagreement. Now get back together again. You guys are believers. Quit, quit making big mountains out of mohills. Get over yourselves and continue to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no... Um, uh, immorality that he's pointing out here. There's no theological differences, no doctrinal error. It's just these two ladies are having issues. How many of us ladies have had issues? And we've allowed those issues to really overtake our service for the Lord Jesus Christ, haven't we? Haven't we found ourselves at time being so put out by a sister in Jesus Christ that we will actually choose to go to a different church because we don't want to have to see them and deal with them? Isn't that sad? But isn't that so true? You know, or you see him in a store and you, uh-oh, and you run the other way? 
We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what Paul is saying. What is going on with you? There is disunity between you, and that disunity, it's going to spread because there's going to be people taking your side, and there's going to be people taking your side. And Jesus' side is completely left out. So what do we do as sisters when we have an issue with somebody? What do we do when we have an issue that just seems so hard to deal with that we really do want to leave the church? We need to repent of that. And we need to seek the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to remind us who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we are sisters and we are called to love one another, to be unified together, to allow God to work through those differences and to help us to deal with those differences so we can come back together again and lift up holy hands to continue to serve the Lord. There is no disagreement so big that God can't fix. We, at times, won't allow him to fix it because we think we're all that. We do. And we can look at the sister and say, yeah, whatever. And that's not what Paul's talking about. We need to allow the Lord Jesus to transform and to change our hearts so we can continue serving the Lord and, and being joyful in that service. Whether we've had a, a, an issue with a sister or not, God's forgiveness can cover everything. What gets in the way is our pride. Now, there are so many times that we choose just to sit in our sin and not allow the Holy Spirit to reveal our own sin to us because we don't want to see it. We don't want to come to the true realization that, you know what, maybe the issue is me and it's not her. Maybe I need to humble myself and let Christ work within me so we can come to that unity again. Whatever it is, we too have been guilty of causing disunity within the church because of our own attitudes and our own hearts. We need to remember that we are sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, I think, amen, awesome, amen. Okay, those of you who are clapping, work real hard to keep that unity going, okay? Don't let, it, let anything trip us up. Paul, I think, was kind of throwing hints throughout the whole letter of Philippians. And, and because I believe he loved these two women, and again, he knows them and he served with them, and he probably knows both of their personalities. And, and not everybody is going to be best friends and, hey, let's all hang out together. That's not reality. But there should be a love that just kind of blankets over all of us, right? And I, I think as Paul writes this um, epistle of Philippians, in verse one, or chapter 1 of verse 9, he says this. And I think this is kind of like a little... Okay, I hope these sisters are, are hearing what I'm saying. I'm hoping that they're going to pay attention because this is really for you. I'm not saying your name yet, but this is for you. So this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and in all discernment. Then he says in verse one, chapter, or ver, chapter 1, verse 27, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So I think this was a, a subtle hint to these women before he gets to chapter 4, as they're reading this, and, and maybe I'm sure that Paul is trusting that the Holy Spirit's going to be working in their hearts. That, so by the time they get to... Um, Chapter 4, they're going to realize, ugh, he was talking about us. We need to set aside our differences and let's keep, keep our minds set on what's right and what's real. It's important for us as Christians to love and to get along with one another for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of one another, and especially for the glory of the Lord. We are sisters in the Lord. That is something that we will always have in common. So we can focus on what's, you, what unites us we are all sinners, saved by the grace of God, and in that we can come together, right? If we can just admit to one another that, you know what, we mess up sometimes. We're sinners. God's grace is sufficient for us. God's grace will cover us. His blood has forgiven us. Let's, let's put the past behind us and let's go forward in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's don't let anything come against the, the truth of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 says this. Again, Paul speaking. Therefore I, 
a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble. Always be gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with God's peace. What a challenge for us. What a great word for us and what a wonderful reminder for us as sisters in the Lord to, to make allowances for one another, to forgive each other's faults and remember that we are all sinners saved by grace. Paul repeats his earlier exhortations from Philippians 3.1 when he says, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He emphasizes the need to find joy in the Lord and in the Lord only. Verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'm going to say it again in case you didn't hear me the first time I said it. Or even this time I said it. I'm going to say it one more time. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Despite, this is Paul, despite being under house arrest, not able to see his friends, not having his needs met, Joy is all over this epistle in the Philippians. In this short epistle, there are 10 references to joy. Paul understands and knows how freeing, rejoicing in the Lord can be deep within the soul. Paul knows that if we are rejoicing, we are not going to be nitpicking on one another. Notice Paul says to rejoice in the Lord and not in circumstances. It's our relationship with the Lord that is a real reason to always find joy the real reason to always rejoice. Jesus' life flowing through our lives will change everything. Remember that as Paul was with the Philippians earlier, that he and Paul, or excuse me, he and Silas were chained in prison. And remember the earthquake and, and the, they were locked in chains, chained to a wall. And yet what were these two men doing? They were singing praises, singing worship songs unto Jesus. These men were filled with joy. And as Paul is telling the Philippian church again to be joyful, to rejoice in all things, they remember hearing him. They remember seeing him. They know that he was filled with joy. So as he writes this, these letters to him, it's not just words that he's saying. This is something that he lived out in his life. He knew how to rejoice. He understood what the joy of the Lord really meant he could, whether he was having a hard day or a good day or was good was happening to him or bad was happening to him, nothing could take away the joy that was settled deep within his heart. And the Philippians knew that. Joy is a supernatural fruit of God's spirit and it is internal. Happiness is external and it depends on our circumstances. Circumstances are going to come and go, but God's joy wells up from the very depth of our soul. Christian unity happens when, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can humble ourselves and come together and rejoice together in the things that God has done. Verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be known to all men, because the Lord is at hand. And in David Guzik's commentary, he says this, There's a good example of this quality when Jesus showed gentleness with a woman who was taken in adultery in a setup, and was brought to Jesus Christ. He knew how to show a holy gentleness to her. He was able to look past her sin and to look at her. This word describes the heart of a person who will let the Lord fight his battles. He knows that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It describes a person who is really free to let go of his anxieties and all the things that cause him stress because he knows that the Lord will take up his cause. So let that gentleness be known to all men. We as believers need to show gentleness to everyone, not just the people that we like, not just the people who get along with us, but to all men, Paul exhorts the Philippians. And he said, and the reason you need to do this is because the Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. He is coming soon, and that in itself should give incentive to live our lives well. When we live with the awareness of Jesus' soon return, it makes it easier to rejoice in the Lord, as, no matter how um, hard our life can become. What do you want to be found doing when Jesus Christ comes back again? 
What do you want, what words do you want on your lips when you hear the trumpets going off? What attitudes do you want in your heart knowing that Jesus could be coming back at any moment? Knowing that he's returning, it should prompt us, compel us to live lives that are willing to sacrifice for others, that we can be an example and wanting others to find the Lord Jesus Christ with how we uh, live our lives. But are we even looking forward to his coming? Do we really understand that the Lord is near, even as our world is falling apart? Because he is near. And this world is messed up. It is so messed up. And we need Jesus Christ so desperately. I read this in, um, I don't know where I got it, but I like it, so I'll share it. <laughs> says the world will drain us and rob us of all spiritual energy and alertness if we let it. We must purpose daily, moment by moment, to seek our rest and restoration in Jesus Christ. Only in this will we find ourselves alert, watchful, and expectantly awaiting the return of our Savior. To this end, the scriptures can call us to be ready. But we Christians can fool ourselves into thinking that we're okay, that we're alert, watchful, and waiting for the return of the Lord, when in reality our senses have been dulled. We can be duped into the sort of inattentiveness that can result in great harm to both self and others as we fail in our own readiness and we fail to warn others. So this morning, sweet sisters, I just want to have you ask yourselves, are you awake? Are you anticipating the Lord's return? Because he is coming soon. Everybody I hear, as we read the scriptures, say that Lord Jesus Christ can come back at any moment. If he do, did, if he does, are you going with him? Are you ready? Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because that's the only way to enter in to eternity. Are we ready? And are we asking others to be ready? Are we giving them a warning? Because you know, as I know, truth is so relative today, isn't it? is it not? You know, my truth is good for me, your truth is good for you, whatever, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but the Lord says no. The only truth that matters is God's truth. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And it's our responsibility, amen. But it's our responsibility as followers of Christ is to share that word with others because they are confused, they're deceived, and they don't even realize it. So we know the truth, we have been set free, and we need to share that truth with others so they can be set free as well. And because of that truth, because Christ is coming back again, Paul goes on to say in verses six and seven, be anxious for nothing. Man, how many of this have this highlighted in our Bible? <laughs> be anxious for nothing. Instead of being anxious in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And if we do that, verse 7 is a wonderful promise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. He said, stand firm in the Lord. Keep the unity of the Spirit. Keep walking with Christ. Rejoice always. Jesus Christ is coming back at any minute. He's near. Not only is he coming back, but he's near right now with us. And because of those truths, we can rejoice in the Lord and we don't have to be anxious for anything. Spurgeon says, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It only empties today of its strength. We are not to worry. We are not to be anxious or pulled in so many different directions. Warren Wearsby says, our hope pulls us in one direction and our fears pull us the opposite directions and we find ourselves being pulled apart. The old English root word for worry means to strangle. And I like that because in my times of worrying, sometimes I feel like I'm being strangled or I can't breathe and I can't handle it. And I don't have to do that if I can do what Paul has exhorted me to do. Well, I think we all know that feeling of being strangled with fear and, and anxiety and worry. Worry causes ulcers and back pains and headaches and all kinds of stuff. 
things that we don't have to deal with on a daily basis if we could just learn to do the things that Paul has called us to do. Worry is wrong thinking, which means it's happening in our mind. And it's also a wrong feeling that is coming into our hearts. It has a wrong feeling about circumstances, the wrong thoughts about people, and the wrong thoughts about things. Worry or anxiousness is the killer of our joy. And Paul wants us to avoid those things. We hear the command not to worry, so we say, okay, I'm not going to worry today. And we grit our teeth, and then we get sick because we start worrying about how not to worry. <laughs> Paul says, don't do that. And he knows us so well. I mean, the Lord knows us so well, so he had to give us step by step how to, okay, I'm telling you not to worry, but I'm going to tell you how, how not to worry. But you've got to continue to read and see what I'm saying here because I don't want you to become anxious about becoming anxious. That's not what I'm talking about. And again, to quote Warren Wiersbe, he says the antidote to worry is a secure mind, the peace of God, the peace of God that's going to keep your heart like a garrison, like a soldier guarding your heart. That's God's peace. He will keep you. He will keep your heart and your mind through Jesus. When you have a secure mind, the peace of God guards you, and the God of peace guides you. With that kind of protection, we don't have to worry. The scripture tells us that we overcome worry through prayer. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Okay, now, as women, and many of us in this room are Marthas, the first thing we do when we start to get worried about something is what? Say something. What do we do when we first start to worry? We panic, right. And then, and then what do we do? Do we pray next? Well, that's good. If you pray next, that's good. I think many of us get in a habit of we start to freak out a little bit. Then we got to see how we can fix it. And then we try to fix it. And then we call our friends. And then we say, oh, my goodness, I need to pray. Okay, Father, help me. And then you continue to do what you do, don't we? That's normally a pretty normal thing. And again, the Holy Spirit knows this as he penned this epistle for the Apostle Paul to have us read today. We don't have to handle life like that. He says, pray. I want you to pray, pray, pray. Okay? I want you to pray. Well, Father, help me. Well, let's take it a little further, a little deeper. Okay, prayer is just conversation between you and God, right? Right? There's no mysterious thing going on. You don't have to say, oh, thou father, or anything like that. It's just your normal conversation. How you talk to your friends, but with a little more reverence, okay? Because God, yeah, we need to talk with him in reverence. So we pray. Three different words for prayer. As he tells us to pray, that carries the connotation of adoration, devotion, and worship. So when we begin to worry, the first thing that helps to soothe our souls is to start praising the Lord, to meditate on his greatness, and to meditate on his power, because he can do anything, and he can do everything. That starts to fix the way we're thinking of things. Next is supplication. So we ask God to supply all of our needs to be honest with him, to share with him those things that are concerning us, those things that are bogging us down, those things that are causing us to worry. Cast those cares to the Lord, because Peter says he cares for us. And then the third thing is to be thankful. Thank him. We worship him. We give him our needs, and then we thank him for answering our prayers, for listening, for loving us, for caring for us. We are to thank him in everything because that is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Being thankful, having the attitude of gratefulness will guard our heart against... Ladies, I want you to hear this. It's going to guard our hearts against whining, complaining, manipulating, having that discontented spirit that so many of us have on a day-to-day -day basis. Having a heart of gratitude and thankfulness to the Lord changes our perspective on life. We can really be anxious for nothing, pray about everything, and be thankful for anything. And then we have the peace, the promise of peace, 
the peace of God which surpasses all understanding is going to guard your heart and your minds through Jesus Christ. This peace is spoken of in Philippians 4, 7. It, it has the, you, we can't even understand this peace. It's the peace that Jesus Christ himself has given to you. And it is so good and so real and so soothing to our soul. We can't wrap our minds around it. But that peace, Jesus' peace, will become ours as we are doing those things that Paul has asked us to do. His peace will guard our hearts and our minds. It's his peace, the peace of God, that will be with us day in and day out as we learn how to give those things over to the Lord. So as he tells us in, um, sorry, John 14, 27, Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your heart be troubled, neither, neither let it be afraid. It is in Christ that we are kept and guarded and secure. So in these first um, seven verses of Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is encouraging us to stand firm. And he tells us those things, so life as a believer, life living for Jesus Christ, will be an example to those that are watching us. As he continues on, and Jean and Sandy and Ruth get up and share their portion of the scripture, just in this one chapter, we would be able to have a victorious Christian life if we really apply what the Apostle Paul is telling us to do. We can stand firm. We need to stand firm. I don't want to see any Christian brothers or sister that I love, that have been serving alongside me, that have walked with me for a while, to fall away and start serving other gods, to start believing the lies that the enemy is throwing at them on a daily basis, wanting to do their own thing because Christ just isn't working for them anymore. If that is you this morning, if you feel that Christ just isn't mm, what you thought he was going to be, I want to encourage you to really ask him to reveal himself to you and start seeking him on a daily basis for who he is as he has revealed himself to us through the scriptures. Not just things that you hear about him or even things that you think about him, but the truth of who he is as he claims to be in his word. Because the more we get to know him, the deeper we fall in love with him and our intimacy with him grows, we want to stand firm. I don't want to just please my Lord. I don't want to displease my loved ones. I don't want to be an embarrassment to my Jesus. And I want to finish well. And as I continue to follow the word of God and apply the truth of the word of God to my life, I am able to uh, ward off, I guess, the lies that the enemy wants me to believe, the lies that he bombards me with on a daily basis. And in that, I can walk worthy of the calling that has been placed on my life. I pray your hearts would be such the ones that are in love with the Lord Jesus as well, that you want to walk worthy, that you want to bring no shame to the Lord. And because it is his love that compels you to want to walk right, it is his love that will compel you to want to stand firm, and it is his love that will keep us. As we continue to look at him, as we continue to walk with him, as we continue to abide in him, watch what happens to our souls. Watch the confidence we gain within our inner man as we continue to serve him. And watch how the world, or people in the world, will look at you and marvel because you're not a messed up freako. <laughs> our world is messed up, ladies. It really is. And I guess that was kind of not nice to say. But you know what? They're hopeless. They are really hopeless. And you know that just as well as I do. But Jesus Christ can fix that hopelessness. He died for that hopelessness. Amen. And I pray. I pray that as you and I continue to live our lives for the Lord, we can share the hope of Jesus Christ to all those that are still um, denying the truth of who Jesus really is. 
I have my loved ones that I'm still praying for who are denying the reality of who Jesus Christ is and they're looking for their own truth. The only truth is Jesus. And I pray, amen. And I pray that we will continue to seek his truth, walk in his truth, and live in his truth so we are able to stand firm in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.